Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. And now for today's podcast. Today I am speaking with Neil Ferguson. Neil is a financial historian, the author of many books. He's also a journalist. He's a professor. He is now affiliated with the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He is the lucky husband of Ayan Hirsi Ali, one of my friends and heroes, also a former podcast guest. And he is most recently the author of The Square and the Tower, Networks and Power from the Freemasons to Facebook. In this conversation, we talk about mostly that book. We talk about Trump and other matters. And those of you who have hated me on the topic of Trump may like that part of the conversation. Neil is really one of the first people to say anything that has given me pause on the topic of Trump. And what he says is fairly simple. It makes Trump look no better. It doesn't take the onus off of the people who have supported him. But I did find it worth thinking about. And it has, to some degree, changed my sense of how bad an outcome the election was, all things considered. So, I'll let you appreciate that when it happens in the conversation. Neil, as most of you know, is a man of strong opinions and a wealth of information. And now I bring him to you. Please enjoy. Neil Ferguson. I am here with Neil Ferguson. Neil, thanks for coming on the podcast. It's a pleasure, Sam. This has been a long time coming. I, you are one of my most requested guests, and uh, you are also a man who's had the good sense to marry one of my favorite women on earth, Ayan Hirsi Ali. So um, well done on both counts. That, that is the most interesting thing about me, and, and she is more interesting than me. So your, your listeners will just have to make do with second best on this occasion. Yeah, well, it's, it's a good problem to have. It sure is. So before we get into your new book, which is fascinating, give me a, a picture of how you view your career as a, an academic and a journalist. You, you are often described as an economic historian. You seem, from the, the outside at least, not to be an entirely standard academic or journalist. You, you're, you seem far more entrepreneurial than that and, and have just walked a very interesting line through the media and academia. So how do you describe your job to yourself? Well, if one writes the history of an historian, it, it usually makes for rather dull reading. I think it was George III who said to Gibbon, scribble, scribble, scribble. And my life is really type, type, type. I decided at some point to become a writer. And that was... That was the starting point. I think I, think I was influenced by my, my grandfather. My mother's father was a, a journalist, an autodidact who'd left school at a very young age. He, he'd risen to be chief sub-editor on the Glasgow Herald before World War II. And he encouraged me to, to regard writing as a vocation. It was something I could do easily from an early age, but it was my grandfather who, who made me consider it a, a profession. So the question that any writer confronts at a fairly early stage is how to pay for the rent and the the heating. Mm -hmm. And the the simple answer seemed to me to become an academic, because as an academic, at least one has a steady uh, revenue stream. One's expected to write. That's part of the, the job. And one's also, in some measure, being paid to teach other people to write. I fell in love with Oxford at first sight as a, as a young man and thought nothing could possibly be more blissful than the life of an Oxford Don. I looked enviously at their book-lined studies and assessed the, uh, the job requirements. One spent only half the year teaching, mm-hmm. three eight-week terms, and the rest of one's time appeared to be dedicated to reading books and writing books. So that was a relatively easy decision. And I think under a different circumstances in a different parallel world, I might just have led a life of blameless obscurity, probably in Cambridge, where I, I got my second job at Peterhouse. Uh, I lived happily at Peterhouse in college, a bachelor don, dining at high table uh, and being insufferable. And I could uh-huh. probably have kept that up uh, for decades 
But then private life intervened. And really from the moment I I became a, a father, I had to be a little bit more creative about about what I did. And mm-hmm. I think that's when my secret hobby of, of journalism began to become more than just a hobby and, and actually a source of income. And, and to end this long answer, then I began to see that if I was going to communicate my ideas uh, to a public slightly wider than the fellowship of, a, of an Oxbridge college, I had to, to not only write for newspapers, but go on television and here I am at the age of 53 doing podcasts with Sam mm-hmm. Harris, still mm-hmm. in, this, in this quest to disseminate my ideas to a, a wider audience and pay for my children. Yeah, well, to repurpose the, the cliche, necessity being the mother of invention, it's, it works out. It's good that, that those avenues were open to you because it's producing very creative work and influential work, and it's breaking down this tired notion, if it were ever true, that you have to be publishing in some academic journal that that only 400 people will read to actually make your contribution to the important conversations that are happening. Clearly, contributions are being made in books written for a general audience now, and that's been true for, for quite some time. And your books are among both the most accessible and most comprehensive. And, and the new one is The Square and the Tower, which is about, oh, I should give the subtitle, Networks and Power from Freemasons to Facebook. And it is about the, the nature of networks, for good or for ill, really. And networks are, are contrasted with hierarchies. So maybe we should just start with some basic definitions here. I think everyone has a, an intuitive sense of what hierarchies and networks are, but perhaps you want to differentiate them for us. The book really begins with a false dichotomy in its title, The Square and the Tower. And one's asked at the beginning to believe that there is a stark contrast between the town square, where social networks form informally, spontaneously, with little real leadership, and the tower where hierarchical structures of of authority reside. Uh, so the image is is that of uh, of an Italian town. Siena is mm. the one I chose in the book. But as I said, it's a false dichotomy. As the book unfolds, it becomes clear to the reader that in truth, there are just different forms of network, distributed networks, which are very decentralized, and hierarchical networks, in which one node, or perhaps one or two nodes, have a very high centrality, have a great deal of of control or power or are able to, to monopolize information or resource flows. So for those listeners who have done their their homework on network science, that notion of a of a spectrum, of a continuum of different kinds of network architecture will be will be familiar. But I felt the general reader needed to be eased into that. And and it's from a heuristic point of view, I think quite nice to suggest that there's this distinction. Because I think in our everyday lives, we we feel there to be a distinction between the hierarchy that we inhabit if we work for a corporation uh, or for some other traditionally pyramidally structured organization and the network of our friends and family. I, I think a characteristic feature of modern life is that one alternates between the org chart of some hierarchical organization, even if it's only in, our, in one's role as a citizen of a state, and uh, the, the social network that we, we inhabit out of the office. So this is the way the book proceeds. You start with this dichotomy, and then gradually it becomes clear that it's, it's really a continuum. Yeah, although I think there are, there are a few features that make the dichotomy worth keeping in mind. There's the verticality of a hierarchy, the fact that the top stays at the top and that you can't really move out from the edge on any level, that everything has to kind of run through this chain, you know, from top to bottom, that classic networks, even with their clumping and clustering, you know, kind of, you know, hierarchies seeming hierarchies that happen within the network, classic networks 
seem to violate that principle. So it's kind of what happens at the edges that seems very different. I think in, in strict uh, terms, one shouldn't really talk about vertical and horizontal. I was at least uh, discouraged from doing that when I started to hang out with the the real network uh, specialists at Stanford. But I think for the lay reader, this is a helpful way of, of thinking about it, that uh, in, a, in a hierarchical structure, uh, there's a node at the top. And I give the example in the book of Stalin's Soviet Union, which is perhaps the most right. extreme case imaginable. Stalin claimed, and in many cases was able to achieve a complete control over the lives of ordinary Soviet citizens and to prohibit or at least make very dangerous unauthorized social networking. So those horizontal uh, ties or edges, if you will, between nodes were hazardous if they weren't, uh, so to speak, authorized or approved to, to graph that. You would you would draw a tree like structure with all the edges pointing upwards uh, towards Stalin, the central node, and none really running across from peer to peer. So I think this is a helpful way to think about it, even if it's not strictly speaking the the technical language one should use. The technical language would be that Stalin in the Soviet Union had the highest betweenness centrality of any node. Right, but um, that's not something that one can readily, readily say on talk radio. Well, happily, we're not on talk radio, though it, it could sound just like it. But one point you make with respect to this dichotomy is that history has really tended to be written by the hierarchies in the sense that, and, and the work of historians has so often been a matter of going to some archive and seeing the, the remnants of some regime in print and writing the story of what has happened in those terms, and, and that networks, again, you know, classic networks, the tissue of, of relationships and, and influences that, that happen throughout an entire society, that tends to not be recorded in quite the same way. And we, we have this distorted view of what has actually happened in history as a result. That's right. Most historians cut their teeth in archives. I did that as a 20-something graduate student. And archives are generally produced by hierarchical entities like states or corporations. In my case, it was the, the Hamburg State Archives that I sat in. And I remember having a very frustrating experience trying to piece together the history of the German hyperinflation of the early 1920s from these official documents. The documents in the Hamburg State Archive essentially presented the world as it had appeared to a bureaucracy and an early 20th century bureaucracy that didn't really want to admit that things were spinning out of control. So to my bemusement, there seemed very little trace in the Hamburg State Archives of the greatest monetary disaster in, in German history, if, if not in all history. Then one day I bumped into a a man at the British consulate, I was having afternoon tea. And his name was Eric Warburg, or Warburg. He listened to what I was saying about the reason I was in Hamburg. And he said, Oh, you must come and look at my father's papers. So I went to the, the office of the, the bank M.M. M. Warburg, and sat in an old paneled study. And there were the papers of Max Warburg, who had been one of the leading bankers of 1920s Germany. And I entered the world of, of social networks and left the world of, of official hierarchy. And here was the story. Here was the story I'd been looking for, because here in, in Warburg's correspondence with his circle of friends, some of whom were in politics, some of whom were, were in finance, I found the story that I'd been looking for. And that was really the beginning of my career as a historian of networks, though I didn't quite appreciate it at the time. And it's only really with hindsight that I've realized I've spent most of my career trying to get away from those state archives and trying to find the records of the social networks. They are harder to find. You need a bit of luck, as I did have in, in Hamburg. But when you find the, the archives of the networks, I think very often you find a more interesting story than the official record in the state archives. It's really kind of the history of private life in many respects, which does such such work for us and of in, and of informal life of yeah. leaders life spontaneous 
life. I, I think that's part of the appeal to me of the private papers of an individual, that it's all there in all its messiness. Of course, one needs to add that every uh, notable person who leaves behind a collection of papers has probably weeded out the embarrassing ones mm -hmm. and retained the all the boring ones and retained the interesting ones. So you, you've got to guard against some selection problems. But I still find as an approach... At the very least, it's 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 right to look outside national or 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 regional government archives because that's the hierarchical version of history in there. That's the version of history that the the bureaucrats have constructed, and it's it's only a part part of the the story one needs to tell. And a quite different picture often emerges if you can get outside that hierarchy and, and enter the realm of networks. Mm. So you make one observation at some point in the book that struck me as highly counterintuitive, but it's fairly arresting. At one point, you, you talk about the, the parallel between what has happened in our information economy with the birth of the personal computer and the internet and what happened in over the course of a couple of centuries, but seemed to have begun to peak in the 16th century as a result of the, the printing press and, and the spread of books and, and literacy as a result. And you say that the time we're living in now, I mean, really the last few decades, is in many important respects more similar to the 16th century than it is to the 20th. Can you say more about that? Yes, this is the central analogy in the book. And analogy is really the way that historians are best able to illuminate the present uh, with the help of the past. I argue that the printing press, as it spread across Europe, uh, beginning uh, with Gutenberg's invention in the 15th century, revolutionized the public sphere as radically as the internet and the personal computer have revolutionized the public sphere in our time. And the, the ways in which these processes are similar are numerous. Number one, the printing press had the same effect on the, the cost of, of a book that innovation had on the cost of a computer from the 1970s until the early 2000s. And secondly, the, the consequence for the volume of, of information were similar in that with that lowering of the price of the, the, the unit of content production, the volume of, of content grew exponentially. The only real difference is that in the case of the printing press, the, the networked revolution, if you want to call it that, took, well, it spread out over 300 years, really, beginning uh, in the early 16th century with the period of the Reformation and carrying on right the way through the 17th and 18th centuries with one network revolution after another, the Enlightenment, uh, the political revolutions that followed from that, but also the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. These revolutions all were driven by the much greater ease of communication through uh, the printed word, but also the written word. Whereas in our time, the same kind of revolutionary changes have been happening an order of magnitude faster. So what took a century back then now takes a decade. And that's that seems like a reasonable way of thinking about this drastic change in the structure of the public sphere. I can't think of a better analogy than the time of the Reformation 500 years ago. And my point is that if Luther had tried to launch the Reformation without the printing press, we'd never have heard of him. He would have been just another, you know, another burnt heretic, whereas he was able to go viral. And the effects of his message as disseminated by the printing press were in many ways as startling to the to 16th century Europeans as, as the effects uh, of the personal computer and internet have been on messages that have gone viral in our time. Well, and of course, the effect in the near term was fairly bloody in Luther's case. Near and far, because in the end, yeah. and this is a really kind of key point, Luther expected this to have benign consequences. 
He thought that once everybody could read the Bible in the vernacular and have a direct relationship to God, not mediated by a corrupt clergy, we'd get that priesthood of all believers that the Bible talks about. Instead, he got 130 years of, of religious strife between proponents of the Reformation, Protestants, and, and opponents. Uh, and I think we are equally surprised today to find that creating giant online social networks does not produce a global community of happy people sharing cat videos, but in fact leads to polarization. And as in the 16th and 17th centuries, it's not just good things that go viral, it's crazy stuff. Then it was witchcraft that went viral as a concept in the wake of the Reformation. Yeah. In our time, of course, all kinds of fake news and extreme views go viral. And we're as surprised by this outcome as, as the Lutherans were. They really didn't expect to unleash more than a century of, of religious conflict. But that's what happened. Yeah, so let, let's talk about the quality of our conversation as a result of these networks and, and social media in particular and the problem of fake news. Because I've heard you say, you say it in the book, and I've heard you say it in at least one previous interview, that there would be no President Trump without Facebook. And this effect that we've many people have noted of a kind of siloing of information where either by our own choice or some perverse tuning of the algorithms based on the, the advertising model of content now, people are becoming more polarized, that connectedness is increasing polarization and amplifying the signal of, of true information, but also false information, and in, in ways that everyone seems fairly stunned by. How do you think about what's happening now and, and what we should try to change? We should never have believed Silicon Valley's promise that if everybody was connected, then everything would be awesome. That, that was a promise repeatedly made from the 90s onwards. It reached its zenith in the things that Mark Zuckerberg, a founder and, and uh, CEO of Facebook, uh, said to the effect that if Facebook could only grow to the maximum extent, there'd be a global community, and in that global community, we'd be able collectively to solve mankind's problems, or words to that effect. And I think he was sincere in that belief, I, I'm pretty sure, and I, I suspect the same was true of the founders of all the great network platforms. I don't even remember thinking very critically about this myself as a fairly early internet user. But we should have known better because not only did history predict that large social networks would be inclined towards polarization, so did network science, because network science has this clear proposition that even small-sized social networks will tend to self-segregate into clusters the term homophily is the technical one, which sounds a little strange as it doesn't, again, get used much on talk radio, but it just means that birds of a feather flock together. Right. And so we see this pattern even in uh, high schools. Sociologists have worked on this since the 1970s when they were scratching their heads and wondering why the integration of schools wasn't going so well. It turned out that even with all the busing in the world, uh, high school uh, communities tended to self-segregate along racial lines. So we've known about homophily. We've known about the tendency for birds of a feather to flock together for a long time. And guess what? That's exactly what happens on Facebook and on Twitter. People congregate into clusters, uh, mostly ideological clusters when it comes uh, to political issues. So we shouldn't have been surprised, but we were because we, we drank the Kool-Aid. We thought that if everybody was connected, then obviously everything would be great. I think the Trump point is a really important one because nobody in Silicon Valley realized until it was much too late that their network platforms were going to be crucial to his victory in the 2016 election, nor did they appreciate at all the significance of the fact that people were paying in rubles for advertising on those platforms and opening accounts, mm -hmm. uh, suspiciously large number of accounts. Uh, in Russia, there was a complete underestimation of the political risk in Silicon Valley, I think because the culture of, of the computer science types of the engineers simply demoted that 
to a low priority. I think as it became clear, and I think this is a pretty clear cut point, that without Facebook and perhaps also Twitter, but I think Facebook was really crucial, the Trump campaign couldn't have won. Heads were exploding all over the valley. And the inquest into Silicon Valley's part in Trump's victory is still ongoing. We're only gradually being able to find out just how extensive the Russian hacking of the system was. But I think more importantly, we're only gradually coming to appreciate that the Facebook advertising tool was the key weapon that the Trump campaign used so much more effectively than the Clinton campaign, that it was able to overcome the massive financial disadvantage it had. I mean, she outspent him two to one and lost. And I think if you take away Facebook and Twitter and imagine that election playing out in pre-2008 technology, he would never have won. So Silicon Valley essentially made Trump possible. And this was definitely not part of the plan since most people in Silicon Valley, I can think of perhaps two exceptions, lean left. Yeah, well, and Peter Thiel is one. Probably Peter Thiel and Joe Lonsdale, who are friends that stand out for their... Uh, yeah, I know Joe as well. I think yeah. their, their willingness to go against the current, and the current is pretty strong uh, yeah. in and around Silicon Valley, to be not just liberal, but progressive, even as you're making your, your millions, if not billions. But apart from them, really, most people uh, were more or less unthinkingly Clinton supporters. And I don't think it dawned on many people that the the internet, which sort of had made by liberals stamped on it, could be used to such extraordinary uh, effect by not just conservatives, but a bunch of of populists. This has been one of the great ironies of of modern American history. And, And that's Part of why I'm a historian. That that kind of irony is what makes history a, a worthy subject of study. Nobody anticipated that outcome. And I still think it hasn't fully been processed in Silicon Valley or in Washington. That the nature of the democratic process has fundamentally altered. So that in future there will be two kinds of candidate: those who understand how to use Facebook advertising and those who lose. Everything you just said is actually agnostic as to whether or not it's a good thing or not that Trump is president, right? This is just what we're talking about here. I want to ask you about Trump in a second, but what we're talking about here is a fundamentally unanticipated mechanism by which political opinion is getting swayed and the usual gatekeepers of information, real journalists and imperfectly, though mostly properly aligned incentives in that community. And into that vacuum where their influence eroded, you have things like Infowars and Breitbart and utterly fake news being amplified on social media and for good or for ill, depending on what what outcome you want. But still, the process now is it's violating every norm of civil conversation and truth testing when you you look at the details. The number of, of stories that are fake is alarming. The fact that the phrase fake news has been turned against real journalism by the people who avidly consume fake news. So like, you know, real news is fake and fake news is real for, for millions and millions of people. It is really a breakdown of public conversation. Before, before I ask you about Trump, let's talk a little bit more about just the kind of truth testing that the norms of conversation are meant to preserve and what appears to be unraveling here. How do you view the role of advertising here? Because advertising is not something that most people would have thought was a threat to democracy or global sanity, but increasingly it seems to be one. How, how do you see ads as driving this process? Sam, you used the phrase for good or ill. This is definitely for ill. Yeah. <laughs> let's let's oh, yeah, not no. be uh, agnostic about that. Just uh, to clarify that, Neil, even if you think Trump is a much better president than Clinton would have been, if that's your view, I'm not speaking about you, Neil, I'm speaking about our listeners. If that's your view, there's still very good reason to be worried about this mechanism that got him elected. Absolutely. You're right to raise 
the issue of advertising. In the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, when the printing press was the dominant way in which ideas got disseminated, relatively few organs sought to make money through advertising. Newspapers and magazines started to do it, but it wasn't really central to the business model in the early uh, years of the, the print economy. Whereas from a very early stage, the network platforms uh, of the internet sought to monetize the search engine, the social network through advertising. And this was a crucial departure, not only because it was business genius, but also because it created an entirely different public sphere with different incentives from the old one. I, I love mentioning Jürgen Habermas mm -hmm. in contexts like this because it's not a name that one gets to talk about on talk radio or TV, but Habermas's uh, early work, The Structural Change of the Public Sphere, was a very influential work in my thinking. Habermas showed how much of the 18th and 19th century political changes in Europe uh, were consequences of changes in the structure of the public sphere. And I think we've lived through a tremendous change in the structure of the public sphere because Facebook, uh, Google, uh, YouTube in particular, but other network platforms too, have a very clear incentive. And the incentive is to demonstrate to the people uh, to whom they sell advertising space online that they have high user engagement that users are looking at content on Facebook, on Google, on YouTube, and they're looking on that, at that content uh, for more than a nanosecond. They're engaged by it. It is sticky. That's how you persuade people to do their advertising online rather than in, in magazines, on newspapers, or on TV. But here's the problem. The things that cause us to linger on a web page are not its truth uh, or beauty, we are attracted to uh, the fake, and we are attracted to the extreme. So fake mm. news and extreme views uh, are, it seems to me, fundamentally incentivized by this particular business model. And I can illustrate this with a, a, an example from a paper that was published after I had finished The Square and the Tower. Now, this paper showed that on Twitter, a, things are likely to be retweeted within ideological clusters. In other words, liberals tend to retweet liberals and conservatives retweet conservatives. Not really that surprising. But what is surprising is that a tweet is 20% more likely to be retweeted for every moral or emotive word that it uses. So the incentive, if you want to get retweeted, is always to ramp up the language. Uh, it's, 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 it seems to me that which is the real pathology here, that the social uh, networks online when it comes to politics anyway, are engines of polarization, that they are designed to drive us apart. It's not enough to talk about echo chambers and filter bubbles, because that implies a certain static quality. These clusters are growing further apart. It is the more extreme people on the political spectrum who are most likely to tweet about politics. It is the most ideologically extreme members of Congress in both the Senate and the House who have the most followers on Facebook. So mm -hmm. I think these are consequences of a model that incentivizes the extreme. Now, at root of it all is our, I guess, our original sin that we can't quite resist stories like the Pope endorses Donald Trump. Even if we probably know the minute we see it that it's fake, we linger over it and are even tempted to forward it. But that's the okay. problem. We, we have this engine of polarization and uh, nothing that has been said or done since the inquests into the 2016 election began has fundamentally changed this. It, it's the same system and I think it will operate in similar ways in other elections in other countries and indeed in this country this year. You seem to me to be not as alarmed by Trump as I am. How would you characterize your level of concern about his presidency? Five days a week, I wake up and I say, this is within the range of, of normal American politics. He's a populist. We've seen populism before. And the Constitution was set up for the eventuality of a, of a demagogue in the White House. And it's working He's constrained. 
so chill. And two days a week, I wake up and I think, hmm, I wonder if it felt like this in the final years of the Roman Republic. And I think that's about the proportion. I think a historian needs to be very skeptical about some of the claims that have been made uh, by, I won't name names, by those who warn that we're descending rapidly towards tyranny by analogy with the Weimar Republic. I mean, this, that just strikes me as a terribly inappropriate analogy. And I, I'm impatient with the talk of, of tyranny, and I will name names. I disagree with my dear friend Andrew Sullivan about this, and I disagree with my friend Tim Snyder about this. I don't think we're descending into tyranny. And I think if, if one simply locates the Trump presidency in the context of American history, leave aside the Weimar Republic, there are numerous precedents for what we're seeing. And the most likely outcome at this point is not the collapse of the Republic, it's uh, the impeachment of the president after the Democrats win back the House in November. That's a pretty much the base case at this point. Right. However, I think it would be excessively sanguine to say that that's the outcome with 95% probability. After all, didn't we learn in 2016 not to have too high confidence in our political predictions? I write a weekly column. That's a good discipline. You're forced constantly to assess your expectations, make sure that you're updating your views. And my column has blown hot and cold for the last two years between dismissing Trump as a as, uh, uh, a hopeless candidate to recognizing that he might very well win. And I, I veer around as I, as I write at the moment between thinking that uh, dreadful mistakes are being made and, and then reflecting that, for example, if one just compares outcomes, comparing year one of Clinton with year one of Trump, and leaving aside the personalities, they're not so very different. It's a difficult line to tread for the obvious reason that in this polarized public sphere that now exists, the man who goes down the middle is in, in the crossfire. It's very much easier. It would be easier for me to have gone fool never Trump, as some of my, you know, my friends have done. But my sense is that that's not the correct posture for a critical thinker. The critical thinker has to say, what is this like historically? And it is not like the collapse of the Weimar Republic. Uh, it is much more like the populist uh, wave of the late 19th century, which was a backlash against globalization and produced Trump-like figures, even if not a Trump presidency. And I think if one takes that approach and tries one's best to be dispassionate, one arrives in this almost uninhabited center ground. It's a lonely place. I have to say, it's not much fun because you're kind of hated by, by both sides. If you go on MSNBC, you're accused of being a Trump apologist. And if you go on Fox, you're far too critical of the president. Drives me right. crazy. But this is, the, this is precisely the pathology that the square and the tower is about, that we have created this extraordinarily polarized public sphere in which to, to take some balanced middle position is almost by definition to be dismissed by everybody as a trimmer. Right. You function largely, if not mostly, in conservative circles, I would imagine. I mean, you, you have an appointment at Hoover, and I'm just imagining what your network looks like. I, I imagine you have everyone is well represented, but you're, you're certainly no stranger to conservatives. What do you make of the fact that concern about Russia's influence in our election is so politicized? And how, and how is it that conservatives perhaps conservatives generically, but certainly the Republican Party, have become enamored of Russia and Putin when they were the party that a few short years ago had congratulated itself for winning the Cold War and ending an evil empire. What's your perception of Trump's entanglement with Russia and where the Russia investigation is likely to go? But then how do you, how do you make sense of the fact that Republicans seem to think this is a species of fake news. Well, let me preface this by saying a word about my own network, which is, um, I hope, a relatively 
diversified one. If you are a Harvard professor for 12 years, believe me, you get to know a lot of liberals and yeah. indeed progressives. And uh, I think if one were to graph my social network, one would be struck by its bipartisan quality because I've never believed that friendship should be based on political affiliation and indeed a friendship circle that is politically homogenous really is a problem. Yeah. So I I guess part of what has made me able to tread this middle ground has been the fact that I talk to people who hate Trump and I talk to people who love Trump and I even meet occasionally people who feel like me ambivalent. On the Russian question, I wrote about that during the election. I actually said in one column that it was the principal reason that I couldn't, if I were a citizen, vote for him, because the evidence was too clear, even in October 2016, that something funny was up when Trump's speeches started to include fake news that had originated with the Sputnik website. You didn't need a, you know, a PhD in criminology to realize there was mischief afoot. How far the mischief went remains to be revealed, and that is Robert Mueller's hard task. I don't know. I do think that there was an attempt by the Russians to penetrate the Trump campaign, just as they hacked the Democratic Party's email servers. I think there were some people in the Trump campaign who were certainly open to that penetration. If it's going to be shown that collusion occurred, I think the bar uh, will be quite high. But we'll see. The key point you raise is why are Republicans not more worried about this? I think one has to not acknowledge that some were. John McCain, after all, was uh, quick to identify the, that there was something fishy and indeed was one of those who brought Christopher Steele's notorious dossier to the attention of the US authorities. So it wasn't all Republicans, but we're in, as, as Andrew Sullivan has written, a tribal political time. And in so far as Russia looks to the Democrats like Trump's Watergate, the Republicans have to play House of Cards defense against that, no matter what they may inwardly suspect or fear. I don't think that's particularly new. The Republicans weren't exactly in a hurry for Nixon to fall and only abandoned him when there was simply no way of refuting the evidence of obstruction of justice. I think it will be very similar this time around in that the big issue will be obstruction. And the, the Republican Party will stick with Trump until there is no way of being able to do that. If his approval rating stays in the 38 to 40% range, then they're not going to desert. They deserted Nixon when Nixon was in free fall. So let me make clear, this is not new territory for American politics. What should strike us is its familiarity. And it wasn't just Nixon. With Reagan, it was Iran-Contra. With Clinton, we all know what the impeachment was about. This is how American politics is played. It's a contact sport. I think if you ask me to guess what the outcome will be, it will be closer to Iran-Contra than to Watergate. Because I don't think Mueller will be able compellingly to show collusion and obstruction. He will be able to show all kinds of funny business, money laundering, and who knows what else between uh, Trump administration personnel and the Russians. I don't think the public will regard that as sufficient grounds for terminating the presidency early. It might even backfire on the Democrats if they pursue impeachment on that basis. But that's my guess. We really don't know. The evidence isn't all out. But it's a familiar narrative. 
And that's, I think, important to bear in mind when one reads that we've entered some new and terminal state for the republic. I guess the one thing that strikes me as unfamiliar is that here you have not just ordinary corruption or accusations thereof. You have the the hostile influence of a an outside foreign power, which which is the, the the very power that this one party has made so much hay about opposing. If I could think of an analogy for the Democrats, it would almost be like if their candidate showed some sign of you know past affinity and and collusion with the Ku Klux Klan or something, and and Democrats who have made much about their commitment to social justice and their their non-racism, they then pretended not to care and, you know, and and the Klan's not so bad and positions you can't imagine anyone staking out. I mean, Putin is, prior to Trump, every Republican's worst nightmare as an ally, and yet now Putin is fairly popular among Republicans. I don't think I would put it quite as starkly as that, Sam, because I think mm. we're not dealing here with the Soviet Union. We're dealing here with Russia. a... Russia that has uh, at least a kind of uh, patina of democracy and uh, market capitalism, not to mention uh, nationalism as opposed to socialism as its core ideology. And both Republicans and Democrats tried over the years to find a modus vivendi with Putin. I yeah. think the 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 reality is that Putin has wrong-footed us repeatedly uh, because he is a tactically very gifted leader, even if he has a weak hand. So I'm not that surprised. The number of Republicans who have been consistently anti-Putin is a small one. Hmm. Apart from John McCain, Lindsey Graham uh, is one of the few who have consistently criticized Putin. In truth, Democrats and Republicans aside have struggled to know what to make of him, and at times have suggested we can find some uh, modus vivendi with his regime. So I don't think it's quite as stark as you, as you suggest. I think what's novel is not that the Russians tried to hack the election, that this was routine in the Cold War, and both sides did this in multiple different places. What was novel was that the Russians figured out how to hack the electronic platforms where politics increasingly is played out. Uh, and this was, this was creative. It was only eight years ago, I think, that Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen were telling us that the internet was basically the friend of democracy and the foe of dictatorship. And that seemed to be true in the so-called Arab Spring. But some dictators got the message and figured out how they were able to how they were able to use uh, the internet. And when you think about all the things that the Russians did, it's hard not to be impressed at their ingenuity. Not only succeeding in getting access to crucial email servers on the democratic side, but also, and this was really where they were brilliant, creating an army of bots uh, to produce fake content on Twitter. And then using Facebook, not just to advertise and to get adverts seen by as many Americans as voted in the election, but this is the piece de resistance. They use Facebook to organize events uh, in the United States, summoning up pro-Trump and anti-Trump or pro-Muslim and anti-Muslim crowds. That's, that really was a remarkable triumph. Uh, of the dark arts of of modern uh, of modern intelligence operations, so we are in that sense we're in a, in new territory. In every other respect, we've we've been here before, and I show in the square and the tower that the Russians have history of they have a long history of of trying to hack networks. They brilliantly hacked the British establishment when they managed to recruit the Cambridge spies. But the technological side of this is new, and and I don't think we've fully grasped its significance. What one final point, Sam. I think it's important to recognize that although the Russians did a lot with Facebook and Twitter, I don't think that was decisive in the outcome of the election, because their share of total content on these platforms was actually pretty small. So much content is produced on these platforms 
by ordinary Americans, billions of posts, 10 billion posts on on election related themes in the year up to the election, that those Russian ads were really a, a drop in the ocean. So they they did a good deal of mischief, but I don't think they were the decisive variable. And part of the problem with the Mueller inquiry is that I think it's tending to exaggerate in our minds just how important the Russian role was. I suspect that if the Russians had stayed home and done nothing, that Trump would still have won by a comparably narrow margin, because what was being done on Facebook and Twitter by Americans was far more important than what was being done by Russians. Yeah, although as you point out, I think it was only, what, 39,000 votes that had to be different to swing this? We don't have such sophisticated historical models that we can rerun the past in a kind of series of Monte Carlo simulations, changing each variable. Uh, so I, I can't give absolute precision to the counterfactual, but I feel more confident in saying no Facebook, no Trump, than I would in saying no Russian meddling, no Trump. You wouldn't say that of the, the DNC email hack? I mean, if, if Hillary hadn't had to deal with that and Comey hadn't had the brilliant idea of <laughs> revisiting it 10 days before the the election. I think in just in terms of what happened to her poll numbers when Comey came out again, I think, I think it's, at least Nate Silver has come out and said that certainly swung the election. Yeah, we can, we can argue about this for the rest of the podcast, nope. given that it was so close. It, it's one of these overdetermined events. Yeah. Uh, you, you could, of course, make the same argument about a whole range of things, including no Hillary Clinton's failure to go to the three swing states that, that she should have been campaigning in. Yeah. I, I think this is this is where history runs out of precision. We can't definitively say how the past would have turned out. We can only we can only speculate. But my more, I think it's a more compelling counterfactual to say if the election had been run without the, the network platforms with old style technology, mm. then she would have won handily. Yeah. Uh, whether whether Comey's one decision, whether the hacking of the email servers would have would have uh been as were they as important as as you're implying it's much harder to say in a close election remember and this is a key point that people forget she was a terrible candidate there was a ton of material that you could have thrown out on social media about why hillary clinton shouldn't be president without any help from the russians and julian assange there was plenty of non-fake content helpful to a facebook campaign designed to discourage people from voting for her and that, I think, is often forgotten in some of these counterfactuals where I'm afraid people tend to simply change one variable that suits their predilections and assume that everything else stays the same, right. which, of course, is right. how things work. Yeah, well, I fully agree that the result was overdetermined. And I, I think you could point to at least three, but probably 30 things that had anyone been different, the result would have been different. I agree. I think if there had been no, let me give you another example. If there had been no ISIS terrorist attacks in the eighteen months yeah. on the United on the United States territory in the in the run up to the election, I don't think, and then I think Trump would have had much greater trouble. That was a huge issue for him. Didn't get a, a, much traction in the in the amongst the coastal elites, but it was a huge issue amongst middle American voters. And so you know there are any number of variables in this in this um, model that you can tweak to get a different result. That's in the nature of close results. Yeah. In the immediate aftermath of Orlando, I remember on my blog, I wrote a section of a speech that I thought Hillary could have given that would have inoculated her against the disastrous difference between her and Trump's messaging on that point. I mean, she was in the aftermath of that. All she did was admonish people not to be racist and talk about gun control. It was just catastrophic. And Trump, and Trump that August gave a speech on Islamic extremism a substantial part of which one had to agree with. And he was the only candidate, including all the other Republican candidates, who was willing to, to talk in those terms. I think if one's talking about 2016, one shouldn't just talk about the Russian intervention. One should also talk about the Islamist intervention, because those uh, terrorist attacks, San Bernardino, Bernardino and then Orlando, had a massive effect on, uh, on voter sentiment. When Trump came out in, with strong language, it polled as strongly as anything else he said in the election. So this is why it is a story of networks, but we tend to underestimate the, the importance of the Islamist network. And as I try and show in the square and the tower, one of the peculiarities of our time is that although 
the network revolution hasn't radically altered Christianity, it has had a big influence on the development of Islam. And mm. the Sunni extremists have uh, understood, as well as anybody in the world, how to use these tools to advance their ideology. And, uh, and that's another thing that doesn't show much sign of, of stopping uh, the, the numbers of attacks, their global dispersion, the ability of Islamic State to continue to convey its message, even when it loses the territorial battle in Syria and Iraq. These things seem to me as important historically, as consequential historically, as any of the other things we've talked about so far. Yeah. Actually, I, I want to touch that topic, however briefly, because it's a topic of our, our mutual concern. But before we do, you, you've used this word several times, which seems to be uniquely significant in your line of work, this, this concept of a counterfactual, what might have happened had things been different. How do you think about counterfactuals as a historian? It, it, it strikes me as a strange thing to have to keep doing, but basically any value judgment we make about any outcome implicit in it is a sense that things would have been better or worse had something else happened. Every moment where I feel committed to castigating Trump and, and anyone who has supported him for the state we're in, implicit in that is some assumption that things would have been better had Clinton been elected. But the truth is, I spend almost no time trying to picture what life would be like under a Clinton presidency. It's a default assumption working on the hard drive that I almost never revisit. How do you think about counterfactuals? Well, first, you should revisit it. And, and I think yeah. uh, for the reason that you gave, that any statement of, of a of a causal nature, let's say, implies a counterfactual. And if you're going to do that, you better make it explicit. It's a lot more intellectually honest. I think quite a bit about what a Clinton presidency would look like. It was the high probability scenario that didn't materialize. One thing that one would want to ask about that scenario is how would the defeated Trump voters have responded? Because the idea that they would simply have shrugged their shoulders and said, oh, well, better luck next time, strikes me as implausible. In the pretty toxic atmosphere mm -hmm. of uh, November 2016, one way of thinking about the Trump victory was as catharsis for the most disgruntled people uh, in the United States. Had they not had that catharsis, one has to ask what the consequences would have been. But that, that's, that's too interesting to let go by. So pl please roll that forward to the prospect of impeachment. Well, the reason I, I use the term catharsis is that I do think that there was something extremely ugly brewing in middle America. And Trump's victory was cathartic for those people who were most aggrieved. Had he lost, there would certainly have been the claim that the election had been rigged there would have been an absolute avalanche of fake news about that. And I think there would have been certainly uh, demonstrations uh, rather different in character from, say, the Women's March, which was the big anti-Trump manifestation of the immediate post-election period. There would also have been in Washington a completely different uh, sequence of events in which the uh, familiar cast of characters from Clinton world reappeared uh, in positions of power, confirming the hypothesis that the Manhattan Martha's Vineyard elite uh, were in charge. And this, I think, would have fueled a pretty ugly backlash. I think the other thing in this counterfactual scenario to remember is that let's assume the Republicans would still have held the House and the Senate, assuming we're just giving the presidency to Clinton, there would have been instant gridlock. And the question I think, which is harder to answer, is what the Republicans would have done if they'd found that their base was perhaps literally up in arms. So I think it's important not to imagine that all would have been well in the best of mm. all possible worlds, if she had won, I think we would have been in a pretty ugly place 
anyway. The reason that I think in this way is partly to challenge your listeners uh, to play out this scenario as a thought experiment. I published a book 20 years ago now called Virtual History, a collection of essays by myself and others trying to make the case that one should be explicit about one's counterfactuals. If one believes, as I did and do still, that Britain made a mistake in intervening in the First World War in 1914, one has to show what the consequences would have been had Britain stayed out, that the war would have been shorter, that the Germans would have won, but their goals were limited, that there wouldn't have been a Russian revolution under those conditions, and so on. I have fought uh, a 20-year battle against historians who think that this is somehow methodologically wrong. And the problem is they don't really understand the philosophy of history. They don't even understand the basic uh, logic of arguments about causation, which any, anybody trained as a, as a lawyer understands. One can't really make statements in a court of law about causation without uh, submitting those statements to the but-for test. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that uh, I shall remain in a minority in believing that counterfactuals should be explicit. But I think I'm right. Sometimes being right condemns you to, to being in a minority. <laughs> That's the t-shirt we should have printed. Well, I, I've cert it's certainly been my experience, Sam. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a good example of this is the argument about the British Empire, which I've wasted too many years of my life on. Anybody who wants to argue that the British Empire was an unmitigatedly bad thing has to show that, uh, for example, India's economic development would have been faster, outcomes would have been more benign under, say, Mughal rule or the rule of any of the Indian princes that would have been, that would have remained in power. I've based all of my work on a deal with the reader that if I'm making an argument of a causal nature, I'll, I'll make the counterfactual explicit. I know I can't conclusively show you what the world would have been like under these altered states. That's, that's beyond the powers of, of, of history as a discipline. History is an imaginative discipline. Now, Hugh Trevor Roper made this point many years ago, and before him, uh, R.G. Collingwood, one of the great Oxford philosophers of history. As we engage in history, we are essentially conducting thought experiments. But those experiments ought not to be circumscribed by silly rules like, we should only write about what actually happened and present mm. our readers with the facts. I mean, if one does that, one's incapable of making any causal statement and one simply writes a chronicle. But to connect what you just said to the prospect of impeachment, first I should point out is that, that what you said about the counterfactual and the, the possibility of civil unrest in the aftermath of a Clinton victory, that once again puts the onus on the Trump supporter, if not Trump himself, who we could well imagine would have been instigating all that, and essentially was preparing the ground for that in his campaign, the way he was talking about the, the election being stolen before he won it. But do you have the same concern about what might happen if the uh, Mueller investigation runs its course to a point where that would satisfy every Democrat? Historians uh, should also like paradox as well as irony and counterfactuals. I think the paradox is that it's ultimately going to be better for liberals that Trump got his chance to be president than if he had not mm -hmm. got that chance. Because we see uh, on a daily basis, that the man of the people is an oligarch, and the beneficiaries of the policies are not the forgotten people of, of middle America. Liberalism is doing brilliantly well out of Trump. Uh, liberal newspapers have seen their circulation surge. Uh, the Democratic Party is awash in cash, if only it had a few better candidates. If you run the experiment of Trump not winning, and Clinton owning uh, the government, the conspiracy theory would be unassailable. And mm. Steve Bannon would be a far more formidable figure outside 
de- denouncing the conspiracy than he was when he was inside as chief strategist and proved unable, in fact, to uh, to rise to the challenges of government. So my paradoxical view is that liberalism will ultimately be the beneficiary of the Trump presidency and conservatism will be the casualty. The question of impeachment, I think, should be seen in that light. By the time we get there, if we get there, let's assume the Democrats win back the House. It's not certain. I think it's 50-50 at this point. Let's, for the sake of the experiment, assume that they win and then impeach him. We know from the experience of Clinton and also the uh, Iran-Contra scandal that it can backfire on Congress if it goes down that road. It doesn't necessarily guarantee the collapse of a presidency. Clinton became more popular even as he was being impeached. Congress is not a popular institution. It has the lowest approval ratings of any major American institution. And I think if they go down the impeachment road with a weak case, i.e. it's money laundering, it's previous business dealings with the Russians, uh, or even with there was collusion, but Actually, it was it was Jared. The president wasn't involved. Then I mm-hmm. think that Trump's base will rally to him, and it will not it will not prematurely end the presidency. It might even make re-election a more likely outcome. So the Democrats have to handle with care if they do find themselves in this position. I don't think impeachment would be a wise proceeding unless. Mueller really has compelling evidence of collusion and obstruction of justice. But do you worry that the the situation is politically is as combustible as it was at the time of the election and that the response... No, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. That's the point about catharsis, that the people who who Discharge the energy. Yeah. yeah, and And now they have to live with the reality of the Trump presidency. Right. And rationalize as best they can the beneficiaries of the, the the tax cut being corporations and the the very rich and rationalize as best they can the fact that he just offered an amnesty uh, for uh, illegal immigrants to try to get whatever wall he can get built. I mean, in the end, the compromises that populists make in power are their undoing. One argument I've kept making, and I'll make it again for for your podcast, Sam, is that this isn't fascism, it's populism. It's a massive category error to compare Trump to Mussolini, much less Hitler. He is a populist in the late 19th century vein, and the populists of that period didn't last long for the very simple reason that when you try and do the things you said you'd do, whether it's to raise tariffs on imports or to restrict immigration, it doesn't actually work. It doesn't deliver benefits to your core supporters, and they pretty quickly spot that. So... That's the way I think about this. Having been put to the test by being elected and becoming president, Trump is almost bound to disappoint his supporters over a over the four year time frame. And if he doesn't, if the economy miraculously keeps going all the way to twenty twenty, if if wages rise in real terms uh, in ways that they didn't uh, during the Obama years, then hey. Then he'll be entitled to re-election because he'll have delivered something to the kind of people who didn't get much out of the previous eight years. One can't rule that scenario out. And when I ask myself, is this a two-year presidency, a four-year presidency, or an eight-year presidency? Well, probably I incline to the four-year view, but I, I wouldn't give very low odds to re-election. Presidents tend to get re-elected, even ones as mercurial as Trump. Okay. Well, like with many things, Trump, he has absorbed more energy than, than he deserves. But uh, I found that very interesting, especially the the counterfactual discussion. I have several topics I want to hit with you in in a kind of modular way, and one you raised, which is the rise of Islam, the fact that the the Islamic State is still a potent ideological force, even as it disappears as a locatable terrestrial reality. And there's certainly a connection between Islam and its extremists and the rise of of European populism. How do you think about, let's look at this through the lens of Europe and the very same lens through which someone like Douglas Murray has spent a a long time gazing. How do you think about the the future of Europe and the immigration concerns and the, um, the influence of the various ideologies of Islamism and jihadism? I really 
defer not not just to Douglas Murray, but but also to Ayan, my wife, on on these issues. I've done some work uh, on questions of European politics and migration, but it's not my area of of expertise. I argued uh, quite some years ago now that that Europe was poorly equipped to deal with large scale immigration, regardless of the uh, religious affiliation of immigrants, because European labor markets had done a bad job of integrating relatively small uh, numbers of migrants in, in previous decades. Uh, if one factors in the cultural difficulty of integrating people from uh, majority Muslim countries, the challenge looks greater still. There are a bunch of uh, of issues I would want to introduce to this module, Sam. Number one, the migration is not over. Potentially, it may grow. Europe doesn't really have a, a secure frontier to its south. And the networks that make large-scale migration possible are growing rather than, than shrinking. Uh, so I think one should assume higher levels or at least sustained levels of migration from North Africa, e North Africa even from Sub-Saharan Africa, and from uh, substantial parts of Asia, and that a large proportion of these immigrants will be, uh, will be Muslims, point one. Point two, the problem of Islamic extremism, or whichever phrase you prefer, jihadism, or dawah, which is radicalization without violence, seems a problem uh, that is most acute amongst second and third generation Muslims in Europe, rather than first generation immigrants. Yeah. Certainly, the people who were recruited to Islamic State and identified as such were predominantly from that group, uh, and many of the perpetrators of the, the worst terrorist attacks, uh, one thinks of, of, of Paris in this context, uh, were uh, born in Europe, not outside Europe. And that tells us that we are concerned as much with networks of radicalization within well-established uh, immigrant communities, as we are with radicalization coming in via immigration. We should probably be more concerned, in fact, about those domestic uh, networks of, of radicalization. Mm -hmm. Final thought I would add is that as long as Europe's political establishments were unwilling to talk frankly about this, and as long as they retreated into the euphemistic cliches, Islam as a religion of peace, etc., the probability was very high that populists, and indeed, in some cases, fascists, would seize the opportunity and attract votes by saying what the establishment politicians wouldn't say. The fact that those elements did not win election victories in Western Europe uh, in 2017 should not lead us to believe that it was all a false alarm and that populism is just a mania of the English-speaking world. I was one of those people who read uh, Welbeck's novel Submission uh, mm -hmm. with great pleasure. And of course, in that novel, it's not uh, the 2017 presidential election that is won uh, by an Islamist candidate, it's the next one. Right when the only way of stopping uh, the National Front from winning is by a united front of Muslim Brotherhood and moderate uh, socialists. So it ain't over, and it's highly likely to, to be over soon. You probably saw, as I did, the projections that Pew published just a few weeks ago, uh, future populations with various assumptions about immigration and uh, fertility. Uh, in the maximum case, by the middle of this century, one could have a German population that is just under 20% Muslim. That's the extreme case, but it's not right. a totally fantastic scenario, given that the numbers that entered Germany during the period of, of open gates were so very large. So this problem is, is a profound one uh, for Europe. Very few governments, I think, have a credible response to it. I thought David Cameron's government was going in a good direction, actually, and that was one of the reasons that Brexit was uh, tragic, because it cut mm -hmm. off a government that was actually getting this right. 
So I'm pessimistic about Europe's future. I, I wish I could be more optimistic, but the trend is not Europe's friend. So m- much of what we've been talking about here can sound like a conspiracy theory if you're on the outside of the conversation. And of course, one man's conspiracy theory is another man's legitimate concern. I mean, there's no question that the networks, and in particular the networks of social media, spread conspiracy thinking more freely than ever. But there's also no question that people occasionally conspire. And and in your book, you talk about various groups that have really existed and now have a kind of conspiratorial luster. I mean, they're, they're, they're part of real conspiracy theories, which is to say, you know, fake news in many quadrants online. So the groups like the Illuminati and the Freemasons and the, the, the Bilderberg group, to which you belong, I was amused to find. So how do you think about conspiracy thinking in your research on networks? And how do you as a historian differentiate the phenomenon of real conspiracy and the misguided concern about it? Well, conspiracy theories are doubly relevant to our conversation, Sam, because of course they are they are enormously important to populists on both the left and the right. And that's been true for a very long time. What's striking is how many Americans today are are attracted to conspiracy theories. Uh, I quote some survey data on this in the introduction to the book. An enormously large proportion of Americans, is it close to half, think that there is some uh, covert financial elite that really runs the country. And what you're getting in mainstream media is just a kind of kabuki show. That notion has two problems for the historian embedded within it. The first is that as long as there are conspiracy theories about the power of the Freemasons or the Illuminati or the Bilderberg Group or George Soros or the Rothschild family, it's hard for professional historians to write about those subjects for fear that they'll somehow be contaminated by the conspiracy theorists next to them on the bookstore shelf. The second difficulty is that if you do dare to go there, and I've certainly dared to go there more than once, it's quite hard to to do that history. The Illuminati who open up the square and the tower are really hard to research because their records were dispersed and more or less forgotten until quite recently. It turns out they did exist, which is delightful because they've been the subject of such wildly overblown conspiracy theories. Uh, but they did exist. They were a, a small uh, society of radical Enlightenment uh, theorists who wanted to infiltrate the Masonic lodges of Germany, starting in South Germany, and spread their doctrines of radical enlightenment. Uh, it didn't last terribly long. It was founded in the 1770s and essentially suppressed by the Bavarian authorities about a decade later. And there were never more than around 2,000 members. Subsequent to the dissolution of the Illuminati, a conspiracy theory sprang up beginning after the French Revolution that blamed them and other Masonic organizations for the French Revolution. And they've never looked back as a conspiracy theory. If you Google Illuminati today, you will enter a wonderful, wacky world of conspiracy theory, which bears no relation to historical reality. And the same applies to the other names I mentioned, from the Freemasons to to George Soros. I think the key here for the historian is to recognize that there was something there, that one has an obligation as an historian to try to write the history of secret societies of hidden networks, and that when one's doing that, one shouldn't claim that they had no influence at all. It would be silly, for example, to say that the Rothschilds had no influence at all at the height of their power in the 19th century. They clearly did, just not as much as, say, Hitler subsequently claimed, because if they'd had as much power as Hitler claimed, they would have been able to stop the rise of Hitler from happening altogether. The theme of the book, and indeed of much of my earlier work, is these networks existed. They were real, 
but they did not have the kind of power constantly imputed to them by the conspiracy theorists. And indeed, the conspiracy theorists' ability to accuse them of that power ended up being a source of weakness for these various networks. And what is the Bilderberg Group? The Bilderberg Group is a, a conference, essentially, that occurs once a year, dates back to the post-war period when a group of mainly Dutch academics and politicians believed it would be a good idea for Atlantic, transatlantic relations to bring together political and business and some academic uh, leaders in an informal and closed to the media conference once a year. And I've been to numerous Bilderberg meetings over the years. If that's the elite that secretly controls the world... We're in worse trouble than I then, thought. <laughs> then they haven't been doing a great job lately. And, and maybe I just miss those parts of the meeting that decide how the world will run the following year. Or maybe they, they don't happen at all. It's always, to me, slightly surreal to see the coverage that, that Bilderberg gets from not just conspiracy theory websites, but the Guardian newspaper in the UK, mm -hmm. when what is going on is, is merely a, a discussion, a conversation, a conference. The right. only really differentiating factor is that there's no press there. And, and I must say, I find that uh, a reason for attending in itself, because the conversation is fundamentally different when people are truly off the record and there yeah. are no reporters present. If one can't have uh, meetings like that without being accused of conspiring, then I think the world becomes uh, an even harder place to manage. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. There are a couple of other words. I don't think we've used them yet, but these are words that strike me as inordinately stigmatized on, to some degree, on both sides. But so I just had a, I did a podcast with Russell Brand who, in the set of people who are different from you, I would put him center to that set and well-networked therein. <laughs> it was an interesting conversation. But what one finds when one goes down that rabbit hole is that words like capitalism and globalization really are, are just radioactive and synonymous with almost every bad thing that we're doing, we being privileged people in power. And globalization, obviously, is a word that on the right has been much stigmatized, and, and Trump and his supporters have put themselves, at least in word, if not in fact, in opposition to the porousness of our borders economically and culturally and with respect to migration. So how do you think about globalization and capitalism now? And what's true about the concerns that so many people are expressing and what is delusional? The trouble about capitalism is a bit like the, the trouble with imperialism. These were terms of abuse, really, uh, originally. And, and they shouldn't, I think, be you know, casually used. If by capitalism we mean the free market economy, then I think the same thing applies to that, that Churchill said about democracy that it was the worst of all possible systems apart from all the other ones that had been tried from time to time. And I find it a bit rich when the likes of Russell Brand denounce capitalism having benefited so enormously from the free market themselves and indeed uh, using all the different media channels devised by the free market to convey their message of contempt for it. I don't know how Russell Brand would have fared had he been born in the Soviet Union in the 1950s or, for that matter, in, in China, but I'm guessing it wouldn't have gone quite so well for him as it did growing up in a Britain restored to free market principles by Margaret Thatcher. So I would, I would say most of this anti-capitalist rhetoric that one hears these days from uh, 
the relatively prosperous uh, younger uh, people in the West is just a combination of hypocrisy and ignorance. If we don't teach in our universities the realities of socialist governments and communist governments, if we don't teach why it is that the planned economy failed and that collectivization caused famine, then of course Mm -hmm. people will be susceptible to fairy tales about a world in which everybody is equal and somehow magically personal liberty survives unscathed. But the history is clear. All experiments that enforced egalitarianism went disastrously wrong, with no exceptions. End of story. Take one more minute on that story. What do you do with the charge that communism really has not been proven wrong because it's never been tried? Well, how about the fact that it has been tried multiple times and always failed? I mean, how many experiments before you give up? Communism Mm. was tried in multiple countries, and it was tried in multiple flavors, from the Stalinist all the way to to, uh, reform uh, socialism, and it never worked anywhere. And the only thing that varied was the body count. The the variation was uh, in the human cost, from the appalling, in the case of China under Mao and the Soviet Union under Stalin, uh, to the merely horrifying uh, in some of the smaller communist regimes. So this is a this is a silly argument that can only be made by people who know no history. The extent of the communist experiment during the Cold War was very widespread. It was tried in every continent, and the only thing that salvaged communism, in the case of countries like China and, and Vietnam, was the abandonment of the planned economy and the embrace of the free market, rendering us, I think, somewhat bewildered as to how to describe these states that proclaim themselves still to be ruled by communist parties, but for all intents and purposes are are market economies or substantially market economies. Yeah. But there is that canard on, on the left that somehow the pure form has never appeared and anything you can cite from the heavy-handed transition from capitalism to socialism or to communism tried by the likes of Lenin or, or Mao, those are contingencies of history that are, are not actually discrediting the true philosophy and the true aim, which is to create something far more equitable than any free market can lead us toward. The core concern, even among the affluent, would survive any charge of hypocrisy if stated just in purely ethical terms. I mean, I think there are many of us who are incredibly fortunate to live the lives we're living. We're under no illusions that we created all of the material circumstances from which we're benefiting. We, we, by no effort of our own, were we born into the societies into which we're born at the time in which we're born and spared a lot of the bad luck that has destroyed the prospects of a happy life for even far more capable people. The moral significance of luck is enormous. And one of the things that's central to your thesis is is the way in which a networked world and a networked economy is creating a kind of winner-take-all situation. And we're seeing levels of wealth inequality that would have been unimaginable even in the recent past and should be unimaginable. I I think as there was this book, which I'm sure you've read, The Great Leveler, whose author is now escaping me. Scheidel is his name. He's a colleague at Stanford, but one I've never met because he's currently on leave. Right. Okay. So yeah, yeah, Scheidel. And, you know, his argument there is that it's usually some very bad things that, that redistribute the wealth and cancel extremes of wealth inequality. But now, I think in his in the opening of his book, he talks about the 62 richest people on earth own more than the bottom 3.5 billion. And now I think even since he published that book a couple of years ago, I think that was data from 2015, I think that the number now is the eight richest people on earth have more wealth than the bottom half of humanity. And you can see where all of this is going, this, that you can't get much more unequal than that. And so to the, the most charitable construal of the kinds of noises that Russell Brand would make here is that this is untenable. It's untenable ethically. And when you see the, the pitchforks 
coming up the, the drive of your mansion, you'll recognize that it's untenable politically. How worried are you about wealth inequality? Well, first, um, it's true that the conflict, that war was the great leveler, that was especially true in the mid-20th century. And if one simply looks at the last 100 or so years, the story's clear. Two world wars, multiple revolutions, hyperinflations, a Great Depression, had an extraordinary impact on the distribution of, of wealth and income in all the countries for which we have data. And that left the world in 1950 in a remarkably egalitarian state. And over time, with relative peace, we've reverted to distributions of, of wealth and income comparable with those in the, in the period before the First World War. It never struck me as plausible that there was a fiscal policy that could replicate the effects of two world wars, a revolution, a Great Depression, etc., <laughs> which was the yeah. argument that uh, Thomas Piketty made in his, in his best-selling book on 21st century capital, and I'm therefore with Scheidel on this. Second point, we didn't really talk about it, but let me say a brief word about globalization. Right. Is that globalization had a paradoxical impact. It tended to widen inequality within countries and, uh, and to reduce it between countries. Globally, the world is less unequal than it was. 30 years ago. But inequality has increased if one looks at national data in most countries. It's increased mm -hmm. not only in the United States, but also in China. And indeed, by some measures, China has a, a higher Gini coefficient than the United States, i.e. has more inequality. So most of the, the Russell Brand or Oxfam arguments omit what has been going on globally by focusing only on the top 1% and the bottom billion, omitting to notice that the big story, by far the big story of the last 30 years has been the rise of a middle class, especially in Asia. Uh, the biggest bourgeoisie in history has arisen in the People's Republic of China. And that is why, on balance, the human race is less unequal mm -hmm. than it was in the period before globalization got going back in the 1970s. So that's the reality. Um, of course, you could just ignore that reality and cherry pick your statistics and then hyperventilate about how unfair the world's becoming. But the bad news for the Marxist approach is that actually uh, inequality on the whole is going down. Now, what you do about inequality on a country-by-country -country basis is a policy issue. If you can get people to vote uh, for more redistributive policies, then good luck. Uh, there's pretty clear evidence that if you uh, raise direct taxation too high and increase benefits uh, too much, you'll end up with lower growth. We ran that experiment in a number of countries back in the 60s and 70s, but no doubt countries will run that experiment again and come to the same conclusions. Do we have an inequality problem in the United States? Yes. What is the cause of it? Well, a part of the cause, as I talk about in The Square and the Tower, is that we already had quite an unequal distribution of income because of the way our financial system operated in the 1980s and 1990s and 2000s. And on top of that, we now have an increased uh, inequality as a result of the uh, winner-takes-all network economies of Silicon Valley. That is why you have this astonishing increase in the incomes of the 0.01% of the distribution. But notice, these uh, super rich people are, are not uh, the heirs of great fortunes. They've made great fortunes. They mostly came from the middle class and uh, they are therefore standard bearers of extraordinary social mobility. They've gone 
from probably the top quintile to the top not point not one percent. That's not the problem. The problem, if you really want to get serious about policy, is that if you're born into the bottom quintile in the United States, the probability of your getting a decent uh, education and therefore an exit from the bottom quintile, the bottom fifth, is really really low. And so the channel of social mobility from the bottom of the distribution out of it is essentially blocked by failing schools. The channel of social mobility from the upper middle class to the very pinnacle of wealth is wide open to anybody with the drive and talent to build a company like Amazon uh, or Facebook. And my arguments uh, in the square and the tower don't, critical as I am of the big network companies, don't go as far as to say, we should break them up and confiscate the wealth of Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg. That I do not say. I think if we're really worried about inequality, we should be worried about the breakdown of social mobility at the bottom of the, the social pyramid. And that is essentially a story of educational failure. As you think about the increased automation of our economy and the, the prospect of increasingly powerful artificial intelligence, are you at all a fan of concepts like universal basic income? Is that something that you think should be seriously considered? My worry about universal basic income is that if history is any guide, it will not be introduced as an alternative to existing welfare programs, but in addition to them. And that is a very bad idea. In in its correct variant, which I'll associate with, say, Charles Murray, it's, an, it's a substitute for the very inefficient systems of redistribution that evolved in the period from the 1930s to the 1960s. But the trouble is, when ideas like this go from the intellectuals into the sausage machine that is politics, they have a way of morphing. And instead of being a substitute for old arrangements, they become a patch on top of old arrangements, and that would be a very, a very bad outcome. But I'm open to the radical solution, mainly because I don't think that the existing mid-20th century arrangements are sustainable. I mean, they're clearly not fiscally sustainable in the United States. Programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are doomed by demographics and medical cost inflation. So something's got to be done. And the beauty of the basic income model is that it is a very efficient way of addressing the problem of inequality, and it strips out some of that cumbersome bureaucracy that, that makes the existing welfare state so expensive. Okay, now I'm going to start running through some potted history lessons here. So feel free to be brief, but you need not be. Uh, I've got time, but I'm now I'm just increasingly mindful of your own. So Kissinger, you've written the first volume of a two-volume or at least two volume biography on him. And you and I both know people who believe him to have been a war criminal and morally classed among the truly evil, really. I recently was on stage with our mutual friend Andrew Sullivan and David Frum, and they disagreed rather stridently about the moral character of Kissinger. It was Sullivan arguing that he was only possibly viewed as a war criminal and, and from demurred. Give me your take on Kissinger. And if you don't agree with Sullivan, please tell us why. I'm halfway through a biography of Henry Kissinger. So I still have volume two to write. And volume two covers the contentious period when he served in the Nixon and Ford administrations as national security advisor and then secretary of state. I take the view that the term war criminal should not be lightly banded about. So I think we need to understand that the charges leveled against uh, Kissinger and indeed Nixon relating to a whole succession of episodes from the bombing of Cambodia uh, to the uh, fall of the Allende regime in Chile uh, need to be understood in, in a couple of contexts. Number one, the Cold War, because the big event of the 1970s 
was the Cold War and the substantial gains that the Soviets were making at that time as the United States struggled with its morass in Vietnam. The second context is all US administrations since at least the time of Theodore Roosevelt. And so one has to assess the record of Henry Kissinger in those contexts. If, for example, it was a crime to welcome the overthrow of Allende and the creation of a military government under Pinochet in Chile, then it must also have been a crime to do the same thing in Egypt when the Muslim Brotherhood government fell and a military a dictatorship was imposed. That was, of course, the administration of Barack Obama that did that. And if it was a crime to bomb at Cambodia, where there were certainly legitimate military targets, given that the supply lines from North Vietnam uh, to the Viet Cong were there, then presumably it's also a crime to have waged a sustained campaign of drone attacks in Pakistan and elsewhere directed at terrorist suspects, but as is well known, claiming many uh, civilian casualties. And that too was the policy of the Obama administration. So my argument is for consistency. There has been no consistency in the assessment of the Nixon administration, I think mainly because the generation that came of age between 1968 and the mid-70s in the United States, many of whom now occupy posts in their uh, twilight years in major universities, it is impossible to pass an, object, an objective judgment on the Nixon administration. They are too, I think, much bound up in the, the politics of that period to judge dispassionately what was done. Uh, what was done in the end to try to end the war in Vietnam with some vestige of honor and credibility. So I think the problem with this whole discussion is why do people make these vituperative attacks on Kissinger while turning a blind eye to entirely comparable acts by multiple other administrations? And I could give many, many examples, not only from the Obama era, but from the Eisenhower era, from the Kennedy era. Why do we hear nothing of the war crimes of John Foster Dulles? I think that's the puzzle. And the only explanation that I can come to is that a strange combination of hatred of Nixon and some subtle anti-Semitic uh, hatred of Kissinger leads to a double standard being applied. There's probably another variable here, which is just the perceived illegitimacy of the war in Vietnam, our fight against extremist Islam, as prosecuted by Obama, is not viewed by many people to be illegitimate. But Vietnam and the bombing of these secondary targets, killing untold numbers of people in Cambodia, that's viewed as beyond the pale. If they're defenders of the war in Vietnam, now they they certainly are not they haven't been vocal for a very very long time so that could be one significant difference well if that's so then why is the opprobrium heaped on the administration that ended the war in vietnam and not on the one that started it the real criminals if you want to have war criminals were the people in johnson's administration who were the ones who escalated the conflict uh you can certainly question whether or not nixon and kissinger arrived at the right strategy for exiting and that's a debate worth having. And indeed, it was a debate within the administration. Kissinger, in fact, lost the argument initially about how they should proceed. But I think what's objectionable is this subtle implication that, that Vietnam was the fault of the Nixon administration. But it wasn't. It was the fault partly of the Kennedy administration, but mainly of the Johnson administration. So why are they not war criminals? Either they're all war criminals, or we're using this term inappropriately and we should stick to using it where it is uh, valid under international law. And I think that's, that's really the argument that will be made, that mm. will be made in volume two. Okay, well, 
give, give a signed copy to our mutual friend, Andrew Sullivan. Well, I gave him a copy of volume one and he clearly hasn't read it. <laughs> so uh, another potted history here I'm demanding of you. U.S.-China relations and the prospect of our falling into the, the much worried about Thucydides trap. You might want to explain what the Thucydides trap is. Well, it's my good friend Graham Allison at Harvard, whose whose book, uh, Destined for War, raises the prospect that China and the United States could go the way of Athens and Sparta in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. And in this analogy, it is uh, the prospect of a rising power, in this case China, that leads uh, the incumbent power, in this case the United States, into, into conflict. I think it's a real danger. And I say, I say that, having been quite recently in Beijing, and having been struck by the growing self-confidence of China's leaders in their economic expansion, uh, in their own internal political stability, and in their growing military capability. I think there was a possibility a year ago or so for the US and China to address a wide range of, of issues, economic as well as geopolitical. But I, I think that that opportunity has slipped away, not least because of the inexperience of the Trump administration in these matters. And I sense increasingly that the Chinese no longer feel it's necessary to propitiate the United States, and they're ready for a trade war if that's what Trump wants. They certainly are ramping up their one belt, one road strategy, which is essentially a strategy for Chinese economic expansion in Central Asia, right across Eurasia, as well as across the Indian Ocean. And increasingly, it seems to me that policy is evolving into a kind of Chinese Weltpolitik, which extends in its ambitions as far afield as Sub Saharan Africa and South America. The United States has a policy, a stated strategic policy of America first. But if you read the national security strategy that was published in December, it is far more combative with respect to China than any recent national security strategy. And therefore, at least on paper, the United States is bracing itself for a more, uh, a more confrontational policy. History tells us to worry about that kind of scenario. Kissinger, uh, in his book on China, now perhaps a 10 years ago, concludes with the Air Crow Memorandum, a memorandum in which a British diplomat analyzed the threat posed by Germany to the United Kingdom, to the British Empire, a document often seen as, as presaging the First World War. The reason Graham Allison was, I think, right to publish his book is that we need to focus our minds on the danger that, that China and the United States are about to reenact that kind of, of a dynamic. But it's also worth remembering that, that Graham also shows there are cases in the past when rising powers and incumbent powers have not gone to war, even if they've had a Cold War type relationship. That's why the title of the book should really have been Destined for War? Question mark, rather than mm -hmm. Destined for War. So you may have already answered this question with that last answer, but what worries you most on the world stage now? If you had to pick one problem or possible problem that keeps you up at night, what, what is it? It's not that. I think that, that China and the United States stand to lose too much from a full-blown confrontation. My sense is that US-China relations will, will get chillier. There'll be more friction, whether over trade or over North Korea or the South China Sea. But, but I don't foresee a 1914-type scenario in our time for a wide range of reasons, not the least of which is the, the existence of nuclear weapons. 
which so raised the stakes uh, for decision makers that that it's it's only really wars between very big states and very small states that happen in in our time. A war between two big states has, I think, been unthinkable since really the nineteen forties. The the thing that I'm more worried about, I could give you a great long list because I'm a rather pessimistic <laughs> Glaswegian. The thing I'm more concerned about is that we already are at war in cyberspace. That cyber warfare is a permanent state of affairs, and there is no deterrence in this realm. There are state actors and non-state actors. They're engaged in activities that range from simple espionage and the theft of intellectual property to more deliberate attempts to disrupt vital infrastructure. I think we'll all wake up with a jolt when a very successful cyber attack hits the United States and causes very substantial disruption. We are the most networked of societies because we pioneered the internet and we have connected ourselves in a whole range of ways. Chinese are ahead in some dimensions, but overall, we're still far ahead. And that makes us the most vulnerable to a cyber attack. Our democracy has already been hacked. And I think the disruption that that caused is no longer really open to debate. But there's much more that could go wrong in this domain. And this is the, the real known unknown. We know it's a risk, but we don't really know how big a disruption uh, could be caused. That seems to me more worth worrying about than scenarios that really belong to a different era, scenarios where battleships uh, or aircraft carriers clash somewhere in the South China Sea. I think that's that's not going to happen. Yeah, no, I actually would agree. I, I would put the threat of cyber attack or, or the, the reality of, of continuous cyber attack very high on the list as well. Neil, it's been a great pleasure to finally get you on the podcast, and I know people will love it. So just finally tell people where they should follow your deeds and misdeeds online. Do you have a Twitter address you want to put out there? I have a variety of different online identities. Uh, there is my Twitter handle, if you want my words in short form, which is at nfergus. There is my website neilferguson.com where all my journalism appears a little after it has been published by the Sunday Times and the Boston Globe and I think I can also be located on Facebook as Neil C. Ferguson at Neil C. Ferguson and uh, having said all that I'd much rather you went to a bookshop and bought the square mm -hmm. and the tower because the truth is in books. It's not online. Well, I will have a link to all those sites, as well as to the book on Amazon on my site where I post this, this conversation. So again, Neil, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sam. It's been a huge pleasure. If you find the Waking Up podcast valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can review it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can blog about it or discuss it on your own podcast, or you can support it directly. And you can do this by subscribing through my website at samharris.org. And there you'll find subscriber-only content, which includes my Ask Me Anything episodes. You also get access to advanced tickets to my live events, as well as streaming video of some of these events. And you also get to hear the bonus questions from many of these interviews. And then there's the Waking Up course, an app built for iOS and Android which I'll be releasing soon as a subscription service, which supporters of the podcast get for free. All of these things and more you'll find on my website at samharris.org. And again, thank you for your support of the show. It's listeners like you that make all of this possible.